Thanks very much for bearing with me, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about something which I am incredibly passionate about, uh, and that is providing a good life for our senior pets. I'm also very grateful to our companion Animals New Zealand for inviting me to speak, and I'm even more grateful, as Anya's already mentioned, to be able to donate um, some funds to a charity which I think does incredibly outstanding work, almost as good as Companion Animals New Zealand, uh, and that is the International Society for Feline Medicine. So let's have a little look at what my plan is over the next kind of 15 to 20 minutes. So we're going to start off um, by looking at some definitions. So exactly what are we talking about when we are talking about a senior pet? And what do I mean when we're talking about senior wellness visits, senior wellness examinations and preventative health care? What's the evidence for these? Then we'll move to um, a few slides where I'm just going to talk about a study that um, we ran in New Zealand, looking at the value of senior wellness programs and senior wellness examinations in cats and dogs in New Zealand. And we'll put that together with a couple of other key considerations for animals as they age and look at how we can use these programs to promote a good life. So we'll start with definitions. And how do we define a senior pet? This is tricky. So all you need to do when you walk into a pet food store is have a look at the multitude of names that there are on food provided for animals as they age. So it's tricky because animals age at different rates. We know that different species age at different rates. And with the species as diverse as dogs, we know that there's an incredible range of differences in the way those different breeds age. As I've said, there's lots of different terminology. In general, when we're using the terminology senior or mature, we're talking about a cat or a dog who's getting older but is generally well. As they then progress through those ages of eight, nine and ten years old, they start to move into what we would term a geriatric life stage. And those geriatric animals are often not only older, but they're often managing concurrent disease processes. So they're less well than those senior or mature animals are. And of course, uh, for every client that's come into the vet clinic that I've seen over 20 odd years, they always, plus uh, pet guardians always want to know what the human equivalent of a senior pet is. So how old is my pet in human years? And there's a multitude of charts that you can find uh, that will give uh, pet guardians an idea about, you know, what that senior pet means. But that's a term when we do start to put things into human perspective that we can really use to illustrate the value of these programs. But of all of the definitions that are out there, this is the definition which is my favourite. So this is a definition that's been put in place by the American Animal Hospital Association Senior Task Force. And that was a group of experts that gathered in 2005 to put together some guidelines around how we should be approaching healthcare for senior pets. So this definition is that a senior pet is one in the last 25% of the predicted lifespan for both their species and their breed. And it's a great definition that takes into account the individual's variability. So we've defined a senior pet. Now let's look at what I mean by a senior wellness visit or a senior wellness examination. So these visits should be starting with a really careful and thorough history. Veterinarians will often use questionnaires to get good histories, to get excellent information about what's going on with that senior animal, what's happening with that animal's physical health, and what's happening with that animal's behavioural health. And history is crucial because there's so many traits that we see in animals as they age, which are indicative of underlying disease processes that might be missed as just simply old age. We then want to move into a complete physical examination. And we need to be really careful in the way that we approach animals that are senior as they come into the clinic. So because of uh, cognitive decline, because of concurrent disease processes, animals can be fearful and they can be sore. So we need to be incredibly gentle about how we approach that physical exam and very, very thorough and focus on those things that, you know, obviously are more likely to be associated with age-related disease. A senior wellness visit should also entail some regular blood tests and they allow us to look at what's happening with the organ function of that animal and also the endocrine function. 
And blood tests are of no value if they're not looked at in association with a urine sample from that animal. And then finally, veterinarians need to put all of that information together and provide pet guardians with education and recommendations about preventive care. So noting that animal's body condition score and giving advice on you know, how to manage that animal's weight, and we'll look at how important that is as we go through the presentation, but also giving advice on nutrition and advice on how to keep that animal free from parasites and how to keep that animal well from a mental perspective as well as a physical one. So let's move to looking at what evidence there is for the importance of regular health checks for our senior pets. So again, I'm just gonna look at those AHA guidelines that I've referenced and look at what their recommendations are or why they see senior wellness checks as being so important. So from those guidelines, they talk about the importance of senior wellness visits and that they provide optimal care for senior pets. So they acknowledge and they enhance the human-animal bond. They help us to promote early detection of abnormalities and they help us to individualise the care for those pets, which enhances not just longevity, but most importantly, quality of life for that animal. And you can see that proactive care for our senior pets is recommended by a really wide variety of you know, global bodies and, and certainly you know, many veterinary associations and ISFM themselves. And for anyone who's interested in this and wants to have a look um, at these guidelines, they are open access. Um, and so you can just look at AHA Senior Guidelines and find a really comprehensive document that's still very, very relevant in 2021. And I guess one of the important parts of this preventative health care approach is that pet owners see our role um, in a different way to how they historically have seen vets, um, vets' job. So looking at a survey of pet owners in Australia, which is done every few years, in 2013, when the question was asked, what is the primary role of a veterinarian? The answer was given then that our role is to treat pets when they're sick. But by 2016, and indeed in the most recent survey, pet owners are split. So they see us as being um, important. Our role is important to treat pets when they're sick. But equally, our job is to help keep pets healthy. And that's something that veterinarians really need to keep in mind when they're talking to people and recommending these programs. This is something that our, you know, our pet guardians are telling us. And then, of course, there are multiple studies that support proactive health care in senior pets. And this study and the next one are um, from the University of Ghent. And you can see with the multitude of evidence that the conclusions of these studies, when we look at large groups of older animals who are presenting to the clinic well, that the need for regular health checks is critical and the vets play a key role in not just implementing these health checks, but also making recommendations on how to make elderly pets' lives better. And just finally, on the subject of evidence for regular checks on these animals, you know, this is a very large survey called the Big Data Survey that was done by IDEX in the US. And they looked at over a quarter of a million uh, records from wellness consultations, so healthy animals, and you can see as an animal ages that there's more likely to be issues detected in that animal, which might require further intervention or further examination as an animal gets older. So we've looked at the published evidence from other bodies overseas. Now let's have a look and see what we found in New Zealand. So in my experience, New Zealand veterinarians are quite parochial. And while we'll accept that there is evidence overseas about the benefit of these uh, checks in our pets, it is something which we like to know is actually going to be valuable and valid for the cats and dogs in New Zealand that we look after. So this is our study at the value of wellness programs in senior pets in New Zealand. And our objective was to investigate the prevalence of undetected abnormalities in apparently healthy senior cats and dogs in vet clinics in New Zealand. So we approached three vet clinics and asked them to look at 20 patients from each clinic, so 60 patients in total, all over the age of seven, 
and all that were presented to the vet clinic by owners who thought their pets were healthy. We asked those veterinarians to take a full history, perform a physical examination, run some blood tests and also have a look at a urine sample and then make recommendations for that animal based on the results of those previous three components for what they thought that animal might require. We were very lucky in that we ended up with a very even split between cats and dogs. And you can see for the dogs, we ended up with a, a nice diverse range of breeds, ranging from small breeds like Border Terriers right through to a 50 kilo Huntway. We had an average age of 10 years and within the dog group, the canine group, we had an even split between females and males. The mean age of the cats was a little bit older, so their mean age was 12 and a half. And unsurprisingly, the majority of the cats were domestic short here, but we did also have representation from a few pedigree breed, sorry, a few pedigree breeds, uh, like Tonkinese and Burmese and short hairs, British short hairs. Again, very even split between females and males. So what we found in this study was that of the group of 60 animals, 47% of those dogs and cats needed some type of follow-up subsequent to that senior health check visit. So slightly more cats, 54% of the cats had follow-ups recommended and noted in that medical record than dogs. And if we just think about that, what that means is that one in every two, almost one in every two animals that, goes, that was going into the vet clinic for the period of that study had some kind of underlying condition that that veterinarian needed to investigate further or make a recommendation based on that their owners were not aware of. And that is an opportunity to improve that animal's life. So obviously we had some real value in finding undetected um, uh, either disease processes or abnormalities that needed to be looked at. But there were some other sources of value and that's what these graphs are representing. So if we're doing routine blood testing on animals as they get older, what that is going to allow us to establish for an animal is its baseline. And that tells us about when we're measuring kidney function, liver function, blood glucose levels, even body weight, we're going to know what the values are for that animal when they are well, and we're going to be able to trend those values. And that's the most sensitive tool that we can have as veterinarians to intervene and detect disease early. The other area where these wellness examinations are really valuable is that they give us information around what kind of risk an animal might experience, certainly as it's getting older, before it goes into needing something like an anaesthetic for a surgical procedure. Some animals in this study were detected to have joint disease and they needed to be prescribed uh, therapies to help them with anti-inflammatory and pain relief. And those therapies, they may have been on for long periods of time. So the information collected also provides us with some really good data on how to monitor the ability of that animal to tolerate those treatments. And then finally, the value from the veterinary team, but also the pet guardians themselves. So the feedback that we got from the clinics that were involved were the clients really liked the information that the test provided them with. The owners got peace of mind, understanding that, you know, these animals had been given, you know, thorough examinations and checks, um, and that any sign of any early um, disease, you know, was able to be detected, um, you know, through the program. And this is really important because both veterinary staff uh, and veterinarians often find that they don't quite comprehend the value and the relief that pet guardians feel when we have a set of normal results. We're often looking to see what an underlying, where an underlying problem might be, and a normal result doesn't give us an answer. But a normal result is hugely beneficial and provides a lot of relief for all of us, you know, who are pet guardians. So if we finally just look at how that information, along with a couple of other points, help to promote a good life for both senior pets and us as their guardians. 
So the following few issues um, are talked about in quite a lot of detail in the new American Association of Feline Practitioners Senior Guidelines that were uh, published this year. There's some really key points in there that I just want to go over before we wrap up. So one of those points is the importance uh, for veterinarians when they're looking at older animals at body condition score. And Fiona, I know you're going to agree with me on this. But there are two different syndromes that we might see in an animal that loses weight, that is ageing. And one of them is cachexia. And cachexia is weight loss in the face of underlying disease. So this is the kind of weight loss we might see in an animal that's experiencing you know, a cancerous process like lymphoma. But sarcopenia is a little bit different. And this is the loss of lean muscle mass in the absence of disease. And this is something that's been recognized in people to increase the risk of physical disability in people. And it also impacts on quality of life and longevity. So sarcopenia is something that we're really starting to pay attention to in our older animals. Frailty is another syndrome. And frailty becomes more common with advancing age. And frailty refers to the decrease in functional reserve, which leads to a decline in both the physiological, but also the cognitive performance of that animal. And a frail animal has a greater vulnerability to adverse medical outcomes. So when we do identify issues that need treatment, then we know that these animals that are, you know, that, that fit the criteria of being frail are more likely to have an adverse outcome to that intervention. So sarcopenia refers to the physical changes and the, the loss of muscle mass in animal ages, and frailty refers to that physiological and that cognitive decline as an animal ages. And where these two syndromes intersect are going to greatly affect what happens with the outcome of that senior pet. It gives us a lot of information about how they're going to respond to therapy, and it gives us a lot of information about what that animal's longevity and quality of life is going to look like. And there are some great frailty scales that are available, and they can be used for veterinarians and pet guardians, not just to help identify the presence of these conditions, but also to monitor response to the corrective actions that we might put in place for those animals. Chronic pain is an issue that many, many senior animals experience but goes undetected. And it's obviously going to have a massive impact on that animal's quality of life. Chronic pain can be very difficult to assess. We know that even the most conscientious of pet guardians can put down changes that are consistent with chronic pain or behaviour changes that are consistent with chronic pain as simply being part of the ageing process. And chronic pain can be occurring, can occur in an animal from multiple causes. You know, we could have a, a, an elderly pussycat that's got dental disease, which is causing oral pain. It might also have degenerative joint disease in multiple joints, and it may also suffer from constipation. All of those issues and conditions will contribute to pain in this animal. And unfortunately, when we identify these issues, we then want to institute treatment for them. And we often treat in a multimodal way but it's very important that we're mindful of the impact on that human-animal bond of multimodal treatment. So for an older pussycat who needs multiple pills to address a problem, is that really going to have um, an impact that's going to improve that animal's quality of life? These are the things that we need to be thinking about. These are the things that we need to be proactive about. Chronic pain will also create conditions like hyperalgesia, so that is a elevated pain response uh, or allodynia. So allodynia is a painful response um, which is seen to a stimulus which is non-painful. So a great example of allodynia, imagine a little frail pussycat sitting on your lap as my lovely, lovely pussycat used to do it in the evening watching TV. And you pat your pussycat, that's what we do, that's something that gives us joy and gives our cats joy. But that, that pussycat turns around and responds in a, in a negative way. It may hiss at you, it may jump off and hide under the couch, it may even, you know, lash out. Well, that animal may well be experiencing allodynia. So that's been a painful response in that animal to a non-painful stimulus. And something like that will have a huge impact on not just the human-animal bond, 
but also allodynia will affect that animal's ability to respond to any kind of therapy that we prescribe. And then cognitive decline. So this is absolutely something which is recognised as animals get older and it's often just put down to ageing processes. So it's a behaviour change that we can't attribute to other medical conditions. So consider a cat who's walking around the house in the middle of the night vocalising. From a medical perspective, it may be that that cat's lost its hearing. It may be that that cat has a condition like hypothyroidism where we do see you know, vocalising. But it may be just because of cognitive decline. And cognitive decline goes underdiagnosed, goes undiagnosed by both vets and pet guardians because it's mistaken for normal aging. And it will have an effect again on the guardian, on the pet's quality of life, on the human animal bond, and all of those things are going to impact on the longevity of that particular pet. And so if we take into account the value of you know, proactive, preventative care, wellness examinations, um, and all of those other conditions that we've talked about, how do we look at providing a better life for us as senior pet guardians? Well, these um, routine, regular examinations are going to help to make us more aware of cognitive decline. They're going to give us peace of mind and allow us to feel happy that we're taking a proactive approach. They're going to reduce our cost of treatment because if we can intervene earlier, that often is associated with a lower cost to treat. It's going to strengthen our bond with our pets and it's going to help us, most importantly, to have a better understanding of that pet's behaviour. But how do we promote, most importantly today, um, that theme of providing a better life and a good life for senior pets? Being proactive is going to help us un identify underlying health issues early. It's going to help us to identify sarcopenia and frailty if we're seeing these animals on a regular basis and we're thinking about these things when they come in to visit. If we can be mindful of the presence of chronic pain and we can manage that in a proactive manner before we get to conditions like allodynia, that's super important. And then finally, we know that as animals age, you know, there are going to be situations where they are going to need long-term therapy or they are going to need anaesthetics. And we can use the information from these examinations to reduce risks for these animals of those procedures. And fundamentally, what we really want to do is allow these animals to live longer, but more importantly, to live with a better quality of life. So there's lots of amazing references if you want more information on this. But I'm going to stop there to see whether there's any questions. Thanks, Anya. Thank you very much, Natalie, for your presentation. Quality of life for our senior animals is just so important. Um, great research that you've done. I love the idea of baseline data from bloods to be able to detect changes later in life. That's just brilliant. And it is so important that our senior animals get regular veterinarian checks. And if there's anything that we can do um, to increase that, um, it's really, really critical, isn't it? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think it's a it's a team effort from everybody. You know, I think um, those checks uh, don't have anywhere near as much value if those pet guardians aren't, you know, very engaged in the process and understanding what they're all about. And I, I you know, I, I certainly think that recognition of the value of checking everything and advising people that it's all normal is something that, you know, often veterinarians are, are at fault of, of, of really not seeing how, how useful that is and, and how, you know, how um, valuable that information is for pet guardians. Yeah, yeah. Um, Natalie, we have some questions that I'm going to we sent to you to be answered. Absolutely. Yes, very happy. Thank you again for your presentation. Um, thank this you. Brings, you're welcome. Thank you. Um,